financial planning and security can sometimes be seen as a moving target. The rules change constantly, and you need guidance to stay ahead of the market moves. This is the Labenthal Report with Michael Hartzman and Dominic Tavella, with additional insight from industry veteran Jordan Kimmel. We'll break down the news, trends, and overall direction of the markets, telling you what may be coming next, investment opportunities, and what to avoid. Now, here are your hosts, Dominic Tavella and Michael Hartzman. All right, I'm Michael Hartzman. Today is Tuesday, August 31st, 2021. And as always, I'm on with my partner, Dominic Tavella. How are you, Dom? Good, good evening, Mike. How are you? I'm very well. Tonight, I'm broadcasting from my home office. and looks like you're in your corporate office in Hopak. Uh, another day in paradise. So. <laughs> you know, Dom, we have been talking about doing a show about Social Security since we really we started this podcast because it's a topic that we get asked all of the time. And um, we're very lucky tonight. We have Rebecca, Roberta Eckhart from Nationwide. She's vice president of uh, the Retirement Institute. And sometimes the show just writes itself because an hour before we went on the air, we got a headline that Social Security is scheduled now to run out of money a year earlier than expected in 2033, which basically is right in the heart of when you and I should be collecting Social Security. So there's the good news, Dom. Congratulations. <laughs> well, I truthfully never expected, nor do I still expect to ever collect a nickel. Um, but for those of our clients, especially that do, um, this was incredibly, uh, you booked it, Mike. So congrats to you. But we did not know this headline was going to come out. But it is a question we get all the time from our clients. Will it be there? Will it help me? And more important, when do I collect? When do I start collecting? So these are could not be more relevant questions to a more relevant topic. Right. And we, you and I both do financial plans for clients. And, I, and I've been answering this question for clients pretty much the same way, that I'm pretty sure that we, you and I, will collect Social Security. Certainly the people ahead of us will. I'm not so sure about our grandchildren. I think there'll be a different iteration of Social Security by then. But um, I think even by 2033, as inept as our government sometimes is and how um, how dysfunctional they could behave and not get along, I think this is a topic, Dominic, that they'll just have to reach a conclusion on and a compromise on to keep the program going. Sure. And you know, we, we don't want to give it all away now. But, Mike, I could not agree with you more. Look, uh, they can agree and disagree on this and that. This is one subject, otherwise known as the third rail of politics. They will agree on, they will find a solution. And the version of Social Security that we have today is not the version that existed 10 years ago and 20 years ago and 30 years ago. It's something that's evolved, adapted, and they will do the same going forward. They have no choice. You know, what's interesting is 20 years ago during the Bush administration, you'll remember this, President Bush actually proposed allowing taxpayers to put their money in the S&P 500. And it was an outlandish idea at the time. Could you imagine how wealthy the Social Security Trust Fund would be if that actually happened? Well, <laughs> there was, I remember the uproar, right, that somehow yeah. we were risking America's future um, I don't want to get too much in, in the weeds on that particular comment, but we should know that the funds currently are invested in U.S. government bonds, which are not yielding a heck of a lot, right? We know that bond yields today are uh, yielding very, very low interest rates. So even in, from an investment perspective, it's being, in my opinion, very poorly managed, certainly not earning very much. And thus one of the problems of why it, may not be lasting as long as originally projected. Right. And then and then on a on a branding note, which is just kind of a little fun fact, I had forgotten or never really registered because obviously I've never been as close to collecting as I am right now. Did you know that the program is actually called the Old Age and Survivors Insurance Fund? Did you know that? Um no. Uh, in full disclosure, <laughs> nope. I think I think I, I may have called that out by accident, but I didn't realize that uh, may have may be what it actually was called. But 
um, it is our form of retirement, uh, right? And it is, unfortunately, for a significant number of Americans, the only retirement resource they have. So it does weigh an awful lot on people's uh, mind and stress level. Uh, God, this is important and we can't let it go by the wayside. And politicians can't mess with it. They cannot mess with it. And and you really created an amazing uh, segue. You didn't even know that because when I talked to Roberta this morning and did a little pre-show, she actually asked me that very question about our clients. You know, how many of our clients are, you know, depending on their their entire retirement on Social Security. Fortunately for us, we don't have that many clients who are entirely dependent upon it. That's why they have us. But um, it is an interesting... But Mike, uh, and I know we're running out of time, but I would argue that they don't depend completely on that paycheck every single uh, month, but it certainly as a significant component of their retirement income, it represents an, uh, a, a, you know, a good chunk of that. Right. Oh, there's, I told Roberta, probably between 25 to 40 percent, depending on the client. Yeah, okay. I would say that's that's pretty spot on. Yeah. So on that note, we will be right back with Roberta Eckert from Nationwide Insurance. Are you paying federal taxes on your cash? I work hard for my money that I keep in cash. And for the life of me, I can't imagine why anyone would want to pay federal taxes on their cash. That's why I keep my cash in the Lebenthal Ultra Short Tax-Free Income Fund. Symbol L-E-G-A-X. Le tax. Rates on cash are already so low. Why pay federal taxes on the interest your cash earns? Remember, it's not what you earn. It's what you keep. The Labenthal Ultra Short Tax-Free Income Fund, L-E-T-A-X, may help you earn more on the cash you've worked hard for and keep more after-tax dollars in your pocket. Find out more about the fund by speaking with a Labenthal Global Advisors Private Wealth Advisor or its sponsor at dcmadvisors.com. For your hard-earned cash, why pay the tax when there's the tax? Labenthal Ultra Short Tax-Free Income Fund. It's not what you make. It's what you keep. Before investing, you should carefully consider the fund's investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses. This and other information is in the prospectus, a copy of which may be obtained by calling 800-441-7031. Please read the prospectus carefully before you invest. Investing involves risk, including loss of principal. There is no guarantee that this or any investing strategy will be successful. An investor should consider the investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses of the fund carefully before investing. The fund is distributed by Ultimus Fund Distributors, LLC, member FINRA. The fund may invest in municipal securities the interest on which may be subject to federal alternative minimum tax. After the fund buys a security, the IRS may determine that a bond issued as tax-exempt should in fact be taxable. There is no affiliation between DCM Advisors, LLC, and Ultimus Fund Distributors, LLC. DCM Advisors and Ultimus Fund Distributors are not affiliated with Labenthal Financial Services, Inc. or Labenthal Global Advisors, LLC. Now, back to the Labenthal Report. And I'm Michael Hartzman, back with Dominic Tavella and our special guest this evening, Roberta Eckert, Vice President of the Nationwide Retirement Institute, which is obviously Nationwide Insurance. Thank you, Roberta, for joining us tonight. Welcome, Roberta. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Dom. I really appreciate the invitation. So good evening. Looking forward to a great conversation. Good evening. So, you know, Roberta, as we talked about earlier this morning, I'm just going to ask you the most common question that Dominic and I get when it comes to Social Security, and that is, when should I take it? 62 for retirement, which I think now is 66 and seven months or 70. Um, and it really, I think Dominic and I do a good job of unwinding that math. But um, could you kind of explain the benefits uh, or, the, or the disadvantages of the different ages and, and how all that works? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's a a little social security joke that goes around that says, we can tell you exactly from a financial perspective when you should claim. All you have to do is tell us when you are going to pass away. And we'll just back into that. Well, of course, you know, that's impractical, not to mention a little creepy. So uh, there are a couple of uh, thoughts around, do I claim as early as possible, which for most people is 62 years old, just like anything else, there are some exceptions to a rule, but let's stick with 62. Um, There is also something called full retirement age. And for everybody, that is either 66, 
67, or it falls somewhere in between. If you were born, for example, in 1954, your full retirement age is 60, uh, sorry, 66 years old. If you were born uh, in 1960 or later, your full retirement age is 67 years old. Now, the importance about full retirement age is that that is the age at which you will receive 100% of any benefits that you would be eligible for. If you claim earlier than your full retirement age, then there would be a reduction in the benefits and that reduction is by and large permanent. In other words, you don't age into a higher benefit, you're locking it down. Um, on the flip side, for every year that you can wait past your full retirement age, there is an 8% um, annual credit. It's called a delayed retirement credit. It works out to be 8% per year pro rata, meaning you don't have to wait for the whole year to cycle through to book that credit. Now, those credits end at age 70, and that's why 70 is sort of a bookend uh, to that age 62 number. So you think 62, 70, um, and those delayed retirement credits, those 8% credits, stop at age 70. So it makes no financial benefit to wait past 70 to claim, although you don't have to officially ever claim. I don't know why you wouldn't, but age 70 is when those credits stop. So um, the thing that I'm sure to tell people also is don't think those credits are gonna go indefinitely and you can wait till 80, uh, they stop at age 70. So when to claim, that's really a personal decision. Um, we can do the math. In fact, at Nationwide, we have something called a social security analyzer. And that lays out four claiming options uh, for clients. It lays out the earliest possible. Um, it lays out the full retirement age option. And then what would happen uh, or what you would need to do in order to maximize your benefit. And that would work for people, whether they are married, divorced, survivor, single, whatever it is. But I think also social security is a science, of course, that's where all the number crunching goes in and the benefits and projecting out to your average life expectancy and so forth. But it's also an art, you know, what, what do people really think that, uh, that they would like to do? And I know that's where your expertise comes in because once that decision is by and large agreed on, or at least that's the course of action, then then you two can create um, other retirement income strategies uh, that complement their social security claiming option. So long way of answering, it's a personal decision. There are advantages to waiting. There are uh, disadvantages financially to claiming early. And in fact, in 2017, 54% of people claimed their benefits before their full retirement age, which resulted in a reduction of those benefits. So it's absolutely something you would want to take into consideration and look at the impact of those claiming options. And Roberta, we're all, we're all working longer, right? It used to be uh, I got to age 62 or 65 and stopped, but there's an additional penalty. Uh, I'll call it that. You might have a better word for it. Um, if you're at 62 and you're working, right, you have earned income and you go to claim Social Security. So that's another factor, right? It definitely is, Dom, and thanks for bringing that up, especially in the era of COVID, because when we do these presentations and we do a, a kind of a deep dive into social security within our group, and so we are asked several questions about that. What if I have to claim early? And I think we've just kind of addressed that. What if I, what if I lose my job or get laid off or what have you and, and have to claim social security early? And then another one is, what if I get another job, but it doesn't pay as much and I claim social security to kind of backfill that uh, loss of income that I had before I was laid off. And there is something called the earnings test. And without getting uh, the numbers uh, or too deep into the numbers, suffice it, to, suffice it to say that two boxes would be checked. And those two boxes that get checked might result in uh, some of your social security benefits, benefits being withheld if um, you are working. So the two boxes are this. Number one, you have claimed your benefits early. And by early, I mean before your full retirement age. So I'm going to digress for just a moment and say it's very important to know 
what your full retirement age, and I'll come back to that uh, in just a sec. Remind me about that. So that's one box that's checked. The second box that is checked is, uh, are you working? And by working, we mean either self-employed or working for an entity or corporation. Interest, royalties, dividends, pension do not count towards this earnings test. So what would happen is that at certain layer levels of income, uh, there would be a, a factor or a calculation that might result in, in a certain amount of your Social Security benefits being withheld. And that would carry you up until the month that you actually turn full retirement age and then the earnings test or that social security amount that was being withheld would stop being withheld. The earnings test goes away. And ironically, after that, many people think of this earnings test as a tax. Uh, it is a withholding, but once you turn full retirement age, the Social Security Administration makes an actuarial calculation, and that money starts coming back to you. But we're not talking about lump sum with interest. It's going to be fed back to you in subsequent checks. So you want to watch for that too. If you uh, work and you are claiming Social Security and you've claimed your benefit early, the earnings test might apply to you. Roberta, two quick, two questions. One's a quick one. And the sure. other one's a little will require a lengthier answer. Okay. You could stop and start your benefits, correct? Yes. You could do that. Um, and then again, some of that decision revolves around your full retirement age. But yes, if you've started your benefits at full retirement age, and then let's say you get this wonderful job that's paying you twice what the last job paid you, uh, and you want to stop your benefits, yes, you could you could put them um you could put them on the shelf as it were. Yes, you could them. Great. That's what I thought. The the question that may require a lengthier answer, and the other question that Dominic Dominic and I frequently see a lot of confusion on is survivor benefits. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So can you talk a little bit about that, a husband and wife? And I don't want to stereotype, but let's assume yeah. in this example, the husband made more in than the wife in, in, in their lifetime together. Husband passes away, which is what happens typically first. What happens uh, to the spouse's benefit? Could you get into that? Absolutely. And that's a great question because, in fact, more than 95% of that survivor's benefit is paid to women. It is informally called the widow's benefit. Don't take them literally because it could be paid to widowers as well. Uh, but it is a very important, um, it's a very important consideration for surviving spouses. So what happens is this, is that if you um, as you mentioned, kind of a stereotypical example, but uh, not infrequently stereotypes are based in, in fact, right? So you've got a husband, wife, let's assume that he was the primary breadwinner or uh, made more money than she did and uh, has, out, or, uh, has predeceased her. In that case, she is entitled to something called a survivor benefit, provided they were married for at least nine months unless there was an accident or act of war in, case, in which case the nine month rule is exempted. So, uh, so they were married for at least nine months, uh, husband passes away. Now the survivor benefit says that essentially you would compare whatever check you were, you were the survivor, surviving spouse, by the way, and you would compare whatever check that you were receiving whether it was a spousal benefit, whether it was a benefit based on your own work history, whatever it was, you compare that with the deceased spouse's benefit. And whichever one is bigger is the one that you would uh, receive. So uh, basically what I would be doing is inheriting my spouse's social security check and taking that on until I pass away. Now I can never take more than one check. So I could not stack up my own uh, social security check, say for my own work history, uh, and then add that widow check on top of it. But whichever is the bigger check is the one obviously uh, that I would select and take that uh, and that would last until my own, um, my own passing away. Roberta, just to follow up on that. So if you uh -huh. took the survivor spouse check and because that was larger, would you then allow your potential earnings to grow and then switch back? Could you switch back to yours because you didn't take it and allowed it to grow? 
You can do that, absolutely. In fact, there was some legislation passed in 20, um, uh, 2015, ironically called the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2015. And what that uh, did was close what were considered some loopholes to Social Security. However, survivors, widows and widowers, are exempt from the rules that were enacted under the Bipartisan ba Budget Act of 2015. What does that mean? What that means is that if the math works out or the numbers work out, I could um, put my own work check or, or the social security check that was based upon my own, my own earnings history. I could put that um, on the shelf. We call it filing a restricted application. Well, we don't, social security does, or restricting the scope of your application. And what I would do is say this, you know what? I'm going to take that widow check or survivor check, and I'm going to put my own work record uh, off, or I'm not going to claim that. And by doing so, I can now take advantage of those delayed retirement credits, that 8% per year. I know that those 8% per year credits will end at age 70. So at any point, I don't have to wait until age 70 uh, to make the swap, but at any point I could switch them. And if my work record, including those delayed retirement credits, now exceeds what I was receiving as a widow benefit, um, you know, I can I can let it ride till I'm 70 or or switch it out. So great question. Thanks for asking that. And, and just uh, for our viewers, the key there is that you should review it annually, right? If you're oh, yeah. collecting as a widow, uh, a widower, you should review it annually and see which one is a larger paycheck, right? Mm -hmm. And then do that switch. Yes, that's true. And even though the uh, my own work check might now um, edge ahead in terms of the uh, monthly amount that it would be paying, you know, it still might be maybe in my best interest to still let it ride until yeah, pause, 70. let it pause for a little while long and collect that 8% increase. Yep. Yep. Hard yeah. to get an 8% increase these days. Roberta, yeah. just to take Dom's question one step further, you have to be married to a person for nine years in order to be eligible for their benefit, correct? Um, well, a couple of things. First of all, Michael, are you talking about a spousal benefit? I am. Or and really provider? my ultimate question to follow up on Dominic's is okay. can a divorced person who has a deceased ex-husband do the same thing as a someone who is married when their when their spouse died? Yes. So divorce spousal benefits work like this. And it's interesting because we have had in our anecdotal history by doing presentations like this quite frequently, um, and we still are just in more, a little more of a virtual world, but we have people that are very surprised that they could actually claim a benefit off of their spouse. I have had individuals say to me, does my spouse have to be passed or doesn't have to be deceased for me to claim a benefit? And we say, no, you can, in fact, claim a benefit off of your living spouse. Now, if you are divorced, the rules say that you had to have been married for 10 years and currently be unmarried in order to claim a spousal benefit while your former spouse is living. Okay, so that's kind of that rule. Now, your former spouse has passed away, provided that, again, you were married for uh, 10 years at least before the divorce, and that if you remarried, you did so after age 60, you would be entitled to the same uh, survivor benefit that you would have if you were still married. And if you don't mind, I'm going to ask a, or comment on a question we get almost always. May I do that? Yeah, please. All right. Yeah, please. So, so typically people say to me, they're a little shocked about this one. You mean I can claim a survivor benefit off my deceased spouse? And we say, well, if you meet the eligibility requirements, yes. And they say, well, well, does my former spouse know that I'm claiming off of them? And the answer is no, not unless you tell them. And your former spouse is not giving up one penny of their own benefit if you're claiming off of them. And then they will say, well, what happens if my former spouse remarries? And I say, now this is tongue in cheek, but I'll say, 
send them a congratulations card, you know, wish them all the best, but it does not impact the social security benefit that you would be receiving, not only as a uh, ex-spouse, but as a surviving ex-spouse. And put another way, the new spouse and you would not be sharing a pool of money. It's not like you've got to carve it up and, you know, she gets half and you, uh, you are getting full benefits and sharing of a pool there. So, Roberta, so, you literally could have multiple spouse, ex-spouse collecting on the same individual's Social Security benefit. Yeah. And, Roberta, I regret to say we are unfortunately out of time. Oh, Roberta, I'm, just- I'm looking forward to picking up this conversation again with you and can't thank you enough for taking this time with us. Well, thanks for the call and you have a wonderful rest of the day. When you're thinking about where to park your cash, for over 30 years in the business, I've been a fan of funds like the Labenthal Ultra Short Tax-Free Income Fund. It's managed for cash and designed so the interest income you receive is free from federal taxes. And who doesn't love paying less taxes? Mike, generating interest that's free from federal taxes is appealing, but I've been in this business for a long time, and people love the potential for more income on their hard-earned cash. Sorry, Dom. But the beauty of the funds is paying less taxes on cash. No, my friend, it's the potential for more income. Mm -mm. Less taxes. More income. Less taxes. More income. Less For your cash, ask your advisor Mm -hmm. about the Labenthal Ultra Short Tax-Free Income Fund. Or find out more at dcmadvisors.com. Well, Dom, one thing I know we agree on, it's not what you earn. It's what you keep. Labenthal Ultra Short Tax-Free Income Fund. Symbol L-E-T-A-X. LETAX. Before investing, you should carefully consider the fund's investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses. This and other information is in the prospectus, a copy of which may be obtained by calling 800-441-7031. Please read the prospectus carefully before you invest. Investing involves risk, including loss of principal. There is no guarantee that this or any investing strategy will be successful. An investor should consider the investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses of the fund carefully before investing. The fund is distributed by Ultimus Fund Distributors, LLC, member FINRA. The fund may invest in municipal securities the interest on which may be subject to federal alternative minimum tax. After the fund buys a security, the IRS may determine that a bond issued as tax-exempt should in fact be taxable. There is no affiliation between DCM Advisors, LLC, and Ultimus Fund Distributors, LLC. DCM Advisors and Ultimus Fund Distributors are not affiliated with Labenthal Financial Services, Inc. or Labenthal Global Advisors, LLC. Now, back to the Labenthal Report. Hey, Jeff, I know you're just back. The selling may go away. I know you went away. You are back and uh, looking really well. So Jeff Hirsch from the editor from the Stock Traders Almanac. Jeff, it's great to have you back on again. And I want to just share before we jump into market commentary, uh, Jeff, um, I have to just set the table again. Uh, When you go to a trading desk in New York City or around the country on almost every desk, is the Stock Traders Almanac. I have one proudly displayed behind for you. I see that. And before I came to meet your team, your dad and your full team, I was subscribing to it every year for 10 years. Just to set the stage again, every day, folks, is a quote on it, a beautiful quote to really just read and digest and think about it. I used to love when your top 10 books of the year came out. I saw how many I read. The ones I didn't, uh, I got them and read them. And that's what a student of the market does. So the Stock Traders Almanac is just as relevant today uh, as it was. How many years ago when it first started? 55. 55. That's exactly what I thought. But so great job. And and I'm already looking forward to next year's. Okay. But but setting up the segment and and Mike and Dom here questions every day. I'm the portfolio manager. I don't talk to that many clients. That's the hard part sometimes. Um, but there's an expression. One of the jewels is sell in May and go away. And that's not really the the accurate portrayal of it. Um, the market changes. Why don't you kind of share uh, not only what that tidbit meant, but maybe what the almanac trends, seasonal things uh, for the fourth quarter, the third, you know, last third of the year coming in? Well, um, 
The strategy is the best six months switching strategy, which was created by Yale, my father. Um, it's not sell them and go away. It's most of the market's gains are made November through April, not so much May through October. Uh, we use MACD and some technical indicators to, um, you know, time that a little bit better uh, over the last, you know, couple of decades or so. But, you know, you've got years that it doesn't work. This is one of them. I mean, the, the whole COVID situation has over overridden it we would we wouldn't have this kind of fiscal stimulus we wouldn't have this kind of easy accommodative fed this long and that's the job of the market and until they turn the spigots off or tighten them down a little bit and um you know we get some more normalcy it's going to keep going up on all this you know easy money and 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 uh free money from the from the fed so you know we we, we trade the strategy we use it and um you know we're lighten up we don't sell a man go away we do sell losers we tighten up we switch into other sectors um but we also get into a lot of great stocks using our screens um like you do uh and into the broad market you know right around you know the the end of september beginning of october when we get our, our macd signal okay and so let's talk about something that has worked for you uh, and is working in and mike and dom are talking to clients every day not what happened but what's going to happen next mm -hmm. uh in 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 your book and i'm i'm going to ask you for the exact title but the book was written a while ago the target date's coming up pretty soon and you had predicted dow thirty eight thousand. Uh, with a terminal date on it. And, and Jeff, it might not have gone there exactly uh, in the pattern you expected, but it's coming right to your number. Uh, I think it's a bit ahead of schedule. Uh, and I think the aforementioned, you know, easy money and, and uh, fiscal stimulus is, is pushing that. Um, there's a lot of, you know, productivity gains and technology gains, which is part of that whole, the name of the book is Super Boom. Uh, why did that will hit? Eight eight thousand thirty eight thousand eight hundred and twenty, and it's by the year twenty twenty five, and it's based on a cycle that Yale discovered back in seventy six. Um, you know, it's it's a long term move. We're in that secular uh, uh, bull market. Um, you can debate when it started, uh, but it, it's 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 working. I mean, that's a long cycle. We've got you know some things coming up here in September that. I think are worthy of, of, of uh, covering. I mean, end of September, September is the worst month since 1950, second worst since 88, worst since 98, you know, uh, since 99. Um, NASDAQ is, is, is got some of the, the, you know, worst performance there. End of the third quarter, week after triple witching, a tough patch. But, you know, I don't see much of a decline here. Maybe a 5% sell off at most, perhaps, or thereabouts. Um, I don't. I don't see what's going to knock it over unless the the punch bowl is pulled and 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 Powell's really you know uh, telegraphs that they're going to tighten up and and I mean tighten rates. Not they've sort of telegraphed the tapering of the of the easing a bit, and I think you know that that could have a little bit of an impact. But until they really raise rates in earnest or telegraph that, I don't see how um, the market's going to going to go down any significant amount whatsoever. Right. Hey, Dom and Mike, jump right in. Yeah, I know Jeff, that uh, if you don't mind, just... I, I, really, I read an article this morning. I really kind of shook my head. Uh, it really compared this market to 1999. And so this that. market is so different than 1999. We have real companies that sell real products, that have real inventory and real cash flow. Um, I, I'd like you to comment on that, if, if you don't mind. I thought it was interesting. It, it caught my eye as well. Um, the thing that you know, I, I thought of initially was, well, 2000 was where we had the top. Uh, that was an election year. Next year is a midterm election year, which is where I'm more concerned when you have disappointment in the president. I mean, there's been some disappointment the last couple of weeks with what's gone on uh, over in Afghanistan. Um, and unless they get this infrastructure bill through, I, I think we can have that sell off uh, next year. Nothing too sinister. But we can have a midterm bear market. But I agree with you. We've got more real companies right now. There's still some uh, that that some of the Robin Hood stuff I think could be correlated. You know, the the meme stocks could be you know correlated to the dot com stock. So there's something there. Um, but it's not exactly the same. Nothing ever is exactly the same. But um, it sort of maybe uh, uh, 
you think about my my outlook for next year, which is in the 22 almanac already. That's that's going to press for some potential weakness, and you know maybe a classic midterm bear market, maybe you know 20 percent or so, or 15 to 20 percent, something like that. But I don't see that big post 1999 sell off like we had in 2000. Uh, we kind of had that already this year. I know it was only 40 days. Um, and we also had the, the, the big one in, you know, uh, 07, 09. So I don't really foresee one of those generational bears like we had in 2000 again. Um, and, I, and I do think there's there's a bit of difference between 99 and now. And, um, you know, but there's there's some correlation. And I, and I do expect weaker uh, market behavior next year. The comps will be harder, um, you know. Consumer sentiment's a, a little bit weaker. So uh, I think there's some things, you know, breath is not that great. Technicals are not um, incredibly impressive. Sentiment, you know, is a little bit too frothy on the market sentiment side, on the consumer sentiment side. So I think it does set us up for a little bit of a pullback next year, maybe a, a mini bear. Jeff, as we go into the end of, of this year, the market, and you, you mentioned the last couple of weeks with the with the crisis in Afghanistan, and, and over the weekend, we had on the 16th anniversary of Katrina, uh, an equal size hurricane blow through Louisiana. And it looks like the market pays less attention to the headlines than it used to. Seems to kind of slough off these headline risks. Do you agree with that? Again, it's that it's that free money and that accommodative Fed that I think allows some of the headlines to, to really be ignored. Um, there's some uh disconcerting things going on in in russia in china you know uh, around the world in the middle east as well not just afghanistan so i think they are dishing off headlines a little bit and i think th the fed and the fiscal stimulus is allowing us to do that my forecast for the end of the year has is, is been pushed up a little bit i'm still looking for you know 4500 to 4600 or more on the s p and not expecting much of a pause um, even during this, you know, weakest month of the year in September. Right. So, Jeff, I'm, I'm going to give you a quiz and I'm going to then I'm going <laughs> to ask you to respond to it. But I, I know you'll get it. So the four most dangerous words in the market are this time is different. Exactly. Exactly. And, and what I've been talking about, um, you know, with our team is that while there was indexing previously and, you know, indexing is increased, the level of indexing uh, and the amount of money in a few stocks right now that are powering ahead change. I think it doesn't mean this time it's different, uh, but just address the the change in the market a little bit from when, you know, I got in the business a long time ago to now in the indexing side. I mean, there was there was indexing that you know when mutual funds first came in, and now we have the ETFs and 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 the indexing going on. And I, you know, but that breath worries me. You know, we we saw what three hundred or something new highs last week. You know, out of Barrons, that that's not really encouraging. You know, um, uh, indexing is is an issue, um, but it's also the retail player has become you know a little bit more important. It used to be all institutions, uh, you know. I think COVID plays a big part of, into what's going on right now because everyone is just, you know, feasting on 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 the the, the stimulus and the and the easy money. But um, I think we'll get back to a more stocks oriented market. Um, you know, now that we have these vaccines and give it another several months or a year, people will realize that you know we've got this thing. Yes, there's people are are still getting a little bit sick here, but there's you know, billions of vaccines out there. And we've really, you know, hat tipped about technology and the science out there, how they put this thing out. And I think that's going to, you know, down the line next year, we make it back to normal with the patterns, the four-year cycle and the seasonals, and maybe right. a little bit less of that straight indexing and some good old fashioned stock selection like you do. Right. Dom, Mike, why don't you throw something out for Jeff and, and, and see what he thinks? So staying on that index theme, Jeff, mm -hmm. I, I was a little surprised myself this morning. Another stat, the percentage of the S&P 500 that basically has gone nowhere this quarter. Um, it was a pretty startling number. Maybe you could share that with us or talk a little bit about it. What was the number that you read? I, I think I heard 40% of the S stocks in the S&P 500 were literally flat or down this last quarter. Uh, back to the indexing, a very few, very small percentage of stocks actually are responsible for the majority of the gain in the S&P this, this that, past quarter. That, 
that's one of those headwinds I'm concerned about. It's pretty bad market for us. Uh, I mean, I look at the weekly highs and lows out of Barron's and, and the advanced declines, and it's it's not been impressive. It's not been really um, conducive or, or correlated to it to a big market rally like we've had here. It is being led by a few people, and it, and that's probably some of the, the, the reason why people start thinking that it's a little bit like 1999. Um, but that can go on for a while. I mean, the market can – can can make a lot of people you know poor uh, over a long period of time because it'll go against you for a long time i think that trend is going to continue until the fed eases until we get some some uh more normal economic behavior and i don't see that really hitting until next year i think we pause briefly here in september maybe a little bit and then continue to rally and i, I look for um end of the best six months around April, May of next year, where all these concerns that, that we're talking about, that I'm writing about, and that you guys are bringing up here, come home to roost. But I don't see that happening right here in the next three to six more more months. So you're, you're basically agreeing with the premise that while the Fed is going to take you know, start the taper program and stop their buying, they're not really going to touch interest rates anytime soon, correct? I don't sense that. I'm not hearing that. I'm not seeing it in, in, in the numbers. Um, you know, one of the pages I, I did, a new page, Jordan, you'll appreciate this in the Almanac. It's uh, Marty's Wise Investing Rules. Okay, and one please. of his famous rules, that we all know, is don't, don't fight, the, fight Fed. the Fed. So, But you know, Jeff, I, I want you to take it one step further because I think, you know, you've addressed and, and I've shared with the team three steps in a stumble, right? The, the first interest rate does not signify the end of a bull market. It's really that three steps in a stumble. You want to address that? Um, that's an old strategy. An old. Some of those things have, have fallen by the wayside. Um, I think we'd get a pretty decent stumble with the <laughs> the first raise. Um, it, it's just been what's you know everyone's been been feeding on and, and what the, what's been fueling the market and supporting. It's it's that that Bernanke put the the Greenspan put the Powell put. It's all been in there forever. For a long, long time. And I'm not sure rates are ever going to get back up to anywhere near the average they used to be because the world's so big. There's so many people. There's so It's just hard for it to for something that big to keep growing. And um, I don't suspect we'll get back to the old school rates. Three steps and a stumble, you know, may happen. Um, I don't think it's 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 happened as repetitively as it used to in the old days. Um, you know, the Dow used to triple while earnings remained flat and, and used to, you know, go sideways while, while earnings tripled. That, that's not happening anymore either. So some of those things ha have, uh, you know, faded away, relegated to the indicator. Jeff, the, well, one of the big components of the Fed is their bond buying program and particularly the mortgage market. Yep. Clearly, the mortgage market is distorted and you have to argue has fueled the, the, the incredible increase in prices in real estate. And the housing market. I mean, a little bit that's like probably an area that's going to get hit hard pretty quick, right? They don't have to raise interest rates to see mortgage rates go up significantly. Uh, that could be the beginning of it. That's why I'm not so convinced it's going to take three steps for a stumble. It could be a you know one step and a and a and a trip, you know, before the, before the big stumble. Um, you know, and these tops, you know, just in general, as you guys know, tops are a process. They take a longer time to to materialize than you know a bottom does bottoms are usually major events like that v-shaped driven by something you know the the vix goes goes up on a um you know a spike and and, and floats down on a feather uh that's just the way the market goes i mean that's why we use a longer time frame macd for for the sell signal than the buy signal because tops take a long time and you know the mortgage market concerns me as well uh i look around you know, I see a lot of houses selling for a lot of money quickly, and then I see some stuff that just sits there. So, you know, it's around me and in my area, which, you know, is pretty pretty decent housing it's market. It's a nice area. It's a nice area. I want to thank you for coming on. I'm looking forward to the Stock Traders Almanac. I can't wait till it comes out of print. And I'm going to leave it to Mike and Dom to kind of summarize things and, and take us out. Thank you, George. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Jeff. It was a great evening. And uh, both guests were fabulous and uh, can't wait to get them both back. I think there's a lot more discussion there. Exactly. So we appreciate Jeff Hirsch uh, coming on and we, we appreciate Roberta Eckert coming on. And you and I will be back here next week, same time. And I will see you down the road.
Be well, be safe. Talk to you next week. Take care, Dom. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, guys. Thanks for tuning in to the Labenthal Report. 